Well, welcome to the Abundance Now webinar. This is seven steps to begin breaking open abundance. I'm your hostess, the Path to Publishing Program Director and unofficial spiritual director, Brandy M. Miller. And we put together this presentation because we wanted you guys to have the help you needed in clearing out whatever blocks that you may have and whatever problems that you may be facing to know what to do to handle these challenges. Because there are gonna be challenges on your way to abundance. So like I said, welcome everybody. I'm so glad each of you has taken the time out of your day to show up. It means a lot to me that you're here. It shows me that you're really interested in the topic to carve out the time from your day. And I'm very, very pleased to have you in this room. I know that this message is special and that you have been specially selected to receive it. Otherwise, you would not have been here and you would not have shown up. You're in the right place. If you've been feeling stuck and don't know why, you know you have great potential, but can't seem to tap into it. You feel like you were made for more, but can't quite get there. You're not living the life you dream of living. You feel undervalued and underappreciated, or you're worried about your future, worried about your ability to provide for yourself and your family. This is the exact right place for you to be. And believe me, I know where you're at because I have been there. This is the Poverty Diaries. This is, this is a book I published in 2014, not because I was proud of being in poverty. It was literally excerpts from my diaries over a series of years spent trudging through poverty, wondering if I would ever get out of it, not knowing why I was in it in the first place trying to find my way. The only reason I published this was I was desperate to raise money to reach my son's boot camp graduation 1,308 miles away from where I lived, and I had no money. I didn't even have the money to pay rent. Now, because, and the only thing that I could think of to offer that had any value that I could imagine was the poverty and the experience of it, and I decided, you know what, I'm not proud of these things, but if I put this together and it helps somebody understand what it's like to be on the inside looking out, maybe that'll add some value to somebody's life. So I stepped out in faith and in courage and put together the Poverty Diaries and published this GoFundMe campaign, hoping to raise enough money. I raised enough money to get there, but not enough money to get back home and not enough money to pay the rent. I didn't even know if I would have a home to come back to but I knew my son needed me and there was no way I was going to miss that. All right, so if you think I don't understand what you're going through, I do, believe me. So before we get started in depth, I want to take a moment to pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you have brought each of us together today to share the wisdom that you have sent our way Help us unpack what it means to be abundant, to live abundantly, to experience abundance, to help us understand you, to help us grow in our connection to one another and to you so that we may each become beacons of light shining in the darkness for those who need hope and have lost it. Lord, I ask you to lift up each person in this webinar and just really bring them to the foot of your cross cover them in the blood of your mercy, sanctify them with the water that flowed from your side, heal them of the wounds of body, mind, and soul, and bring about into their lives the fruit of your abundant spirit of love. I ask all of this in the power of your most holy and sacred name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, why pray? I mean, a lot of people ask that question, why would you pray? And I'll tell you, because prayer sets the mind's internal radar. You have an internal radar that is set to pick up signals all around you on any topic you're interested in. But you gotta set the intention. It's like the dial on a radio. If you don't set that dial, 
the signal, you're not going to pick up the signal you want. You know, you got to, you've got to tune in to the signal you want. And it clarifies your intentions. What is it your heart wants? What is it your heart desires? When you have the clarity of intention and you set your mind's internal radar on that, the mind will go to work trying to find a way to get you where you want to be. Second, it calms the brain. It enables you to think clearly because it clears out all the garbage, all those thoughts that have been chasing around and around in circles with no answers. Prayer calms that noise and allows you to pick up clear moments of thought, the ideas that will actually help you move forward. And it taps into a power greater than your own. There is no power greater than the force that created all of us. And you can tap straight into his knowledge, wisdom, understanding, experience, and sight if you just ask for him to give that to you. And in my experience, the most important reason, it's essential to breaking open abundance. Now, if you're not a believer, you don't have to believe to benefit from giving it a try. Okay? Prayer works even if you don't necessarily believe there's a God. Give it a try and find out. What prayer is not? I want to set the expectations for what you're going to get out of prayer. Okay? Prayer is not a Pez dispenser, a magic eight ball, or a mathematical formula. You don't plug in X and get Y. You don't get to shake the ball and get the automatic answer you want. And you don't get to pull the head back and pull the candy out of the mouth of the Pez dispenser. God is not a vending machine. You don't put the coin in and get your candy. What he is, well, prayer is a conversation with the embodiment of all love, hope, and joy about who you are, where you are, exactly as you are, and where you'd like to be in life. And he will guide you if you give it over to him on how to get there, what steps you need to take. He will help you become the person you must be in order to get where you want to be. But you got to turn it over to him. You can't, <laughs> trust me, if he gave you the answers you expected all the time, that would not be a conversation with a deity that's all powerful. That would be at best a conversation with an automated robot who's just there to serve your needs. You don't want all of the things you ask for. You may not realize it, but a lot of times the things we ask for aren't actually good for us or wouldn't benefit us in the long run. So asking for them would be kind of crazy if we truly understood all the circumstances. But we ask for them because we're short-sighted and we don't understand. I'll tell you a short story. So there's a man, and he's wandering lost in the desert, right? And he's hot, miserable, and he, he's begging God. He's like, God, please send me water. Please, please send me water. And no rain comes, no water. And he walks, and he walks, and he walks, and he trips over this rusty tin can buried in the sand, gets mad, kicks it as hard as he can and keeps it going. Another couple of hours go along. He's hotter and more miserable yet. And he, he's begging, God, please, please send me water. Please send me water. Please, please send me water. And he trips over another rusty tin can, gets mad, kicks it as hard as he can, and keeps going. And then... You know, he's like, God, please, please, I can't stand it anymore, please. Finally, he's just, he can't go another step. He collapses on the floor of the desert. He's just bawling his eyes out. He's like, God, why don't you answer me? Why? And then, you know, he cries to the point where he's got nothing left in him, and he's just laying there in the quiet, and he hears, you fool. What were you going to put that water in? If I had sent you water what would you have put it in? And do you think that at some point in time you might have wanted to eat? Because, you know, if you'd have picked up that rusty tin can I sent you, you would have had something to carry the water. You would have had something 
to put food in. And oh yeah, by the way, see all the sand around here? If you'd taken some of that sand and polished that tin can, you would have had something to signal the plane that I'm sending your way to rescue you. So maybe get up and go get your tin can and let's be done with this already, okay? We see the short-sighted thing. We see what we think we need. God sees the big picture of all that we need. So when we pray, we shouldn't expect that our prayers get answered the way we want them to be. Because we see a short picture, and he sees the big one. How we know prayer works, right? We don't know prayer works because it delivers what we want or changes the world around us. We know prayer works because it changes us. It starts making us turn into the person we have to be in order to get where we want to go. So full disclaimer, I'm not trying to convert you to any specific religion or belief. I'm simply trying to equip you and transform you and lead you into a life of abundance. And these are the tools that I have found work for me in getting where I'm at today. So introductions. Um, who I am, I'm Brandy M. Miller, the program director and unofficial spiritual director to the PATH publishing team. I'm also an international speaker, award-winning author, and creative strategist, verified literary consultant, member of the board of directors for Path to Publishing. Aren't those lovely credentials? <laughs> and who I am also at the same time. I'm a recovering narcissist. I allow the embodiment of all love, hope, and joy to reach in and heal my heart, and I still have a long way to go. I'm Catholic, the capital C. But you don't have to be for me to love you right where you are. I went from publishing the Poverty Diaries in 2014 to turning problems into profits in 2019, and now I'm writing the life of my dreams. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Now, how Joy Lynn and I met, Ms. Path to Publishing herself. It all got started in Vegas, as many good stories do. <laughs> I accepted an invitation for a speaking engagement in Vegas. Um, Joy Lynn was there, she was speaking too, and I knew after listening to her presentation that she and I were going to be working together, I just didn't know exactly how, and that was in 2018. Now, what everybody didn't know behind the scenes of that, I had no idea where I was going to be living after that engagement was over. I was literally homeless, and... <clears throat> <laughs> they barely making ends meet. And the only thing I had going for me at the time was my writing business. And that writing business wasn't stable, but it did save me and my family from being stuck and stranded in Winnemucca, Nevada, which I don't know if you guys have any clue where Winnemucca, Nevada is, but that's okay because most of the world doesn't either. It's like a town of less than 10,000 people in the northwest corner of Nevada. Okay. <laughs> It's a tiny town. <clears throat> and that's a long story as to how we almost got stranded there. And it was my writing business that allowed us to have enough money to make it to Vegas and then back to Texas, where I had family who could help us. But that meeting was the beginning of great things. I stepped out in faith. Now, here's where things changed for me. This July, I went, it started with me volunteering to help at church. And I went there and at the end of the day, they invited us all in for mass and they had a beautiful ceremony before mass began. And one of the things that the presenter said was that before you reach your next level of um, service for the Lord, you will need a new anointing. And that's exactly what they did that day. They anointed all of us with the Holy Spirit. And after that event, now I am not the kind of person who likes to be on camera. Believe it or not, I have trouble with consistency in front of the camera because I don't like to record myself. So at any rate, I went home and I had this amazing insight into a series of videos I needed to put together. I started putting them together. I shared them with Joy Lynn. And I don't remember which video it was, but one, during one of them, I offered anybody who wanted it that I would help them with breaking open abundance. 
boom, that next day, Joy Lynn, I had no idea where my journey was going. Okay. The next morning, Joy Lynn calls me. And here's her side of the story. And I'll just go ahead and read this verbatim because it's so deeply embedded in my heart and my spirit and my soul. I wouldn't change a word anyway. Um, one night I tossed and turned in complete misery and confusion. I will ad lib here. I was in my downstairs of the condo. We have a three level condo. Um, I couldn't even sleep upstairs in the bed. I was just on the couch. I was tossing, I was turning, I was so heavy. And I, it was almost like I, I couldn't breathe. I, I was just so fed up that night. And I just couldn't put my finger on what is going on. It, it was, it was an, an energy. It was things that were happening. It was things that wasn't happening, but I know it, it, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel right. Something was missing. Something was wrong. Um, I'm, I've always been a hundred percent clear on my calling and my assignment and my purpose since the inception of Path to Publishing. I was 100%, I am still 100% confident that I was and am operating in complete excellence while executing the task needed to do things decent in order and with integrity. But what I couldn't understand was why I was feeling that way, why I felt so stagnant, why I felt so heavy and, and, and so suffocated. And why did I feel like a hamster in a wheel? Why wasn't I elevating to the promised land that God showed me? I knew what the promise was. I knew exactly what it looked like. And I felt, I thought I was taking the exact steps that I needed in order to meet God at the promise. Because see, faith for me is not believing that God can and will do a thing. It's knowing that it's already done. That's what faith looks like to me. It's knowing that it's done. When God said, let there be light, there was light. So when God showed me my promise, I knew it was already done. And I again felt as though I was taking the steps needed to meet God at that promise. But I could literally, literally feel the blockage in my body. It was physical, it was mental, it was emotional, it was spiritual, which was the first sign that whatever was in my way from accelerating and being promoted had nothing to do with the universe or outside obstacles, forces and challenges, but everything to do with me. I felt it inside me. The blockage was physically in me. And the last thing I did that night before I was finally able to embrace a couple hours of sleep was to ask God to show me what and where the blockage was and to equip and empower me what with ever I needed to break through that blockage. And it wasn't really a, a, a request. It was more of a demand. I needed God to show me. I told God, I cannot do this another day. I cannot do this another night. I literally said, when I wake up in the morning, I need an answer. I need a sign, miracle, wonder, frost on the grass. I don't know what it's going to be, but show me something. And lo and behold, that next morning, Brandy Miller was in my inbox presenting to me the exact program that I needed. And one of the titles Brandy left off is that she is our Path to Publishing um, Programs Coordinator. And so Brandy brings programs to me like, we'll literally be walking through a car lot shopping for cars or in the grocery store and hey I got this idea for a program I got this idea hey I had that idea too it's on my computer we'll pull things up and see oh my goodness take screenshots I thought of this 10 years ago I thought of it 15 years ago wow it's coming into alignment and so when I saw 
those, I can't even remember what the message was, but I just know it was something about breaking open abundance, removing blockage. It, it was the exact wording. Again, it was in alignment with what I had asked God for, what I had demanded <laughs> God deliver to me. So I immediately hopped on the phone with Brandy and was instantly 100% sure that she was God sent and that the program God had instilled in her and was using her as his vessel to deliver was the answer. The thing about me is very, very seldomly do I have to say, well, let me go pray on it. Well, let me go talk to my husband. Well, let me go think about it. I'm in a place in my spiritual walk where I'm going to go ahead and have a discussion with the CEO, <laughs> with the head of my life um, before I even engage. So when I get on a call with someone, I typically already know what my answer is going to be, whether I want to work with them or not, whether I want to pick up what they're putting down, whether I want to pull out my wallet for what they're selling. I've already had that conversation with God to know whether it's in alignment with his plan for me, with my dreams, with my visions, with my goals. So there was no teetering the fence. There was no wavering. It was sign me up, you know, and with Path to Publishing, a lot of the programs that we create, well, all of the programs we create, we test them out first. Um, here, the, the, the Path to Publishing family, the team members, we test those programs out first and we pay. So just because we're a team, just because we're a family, we, we really value one another's expertise. So it was, you know, this is the beta. How much, how much for the beta? You know, I'm going to be the guinea pig. <laughs> Not necessarily for a lack of better words. But I, I cashed that Brandy while we were still on the phone. I said, before I can present this to the Pathfinders, you know, I have to test it out first. But I know this is what I need to take me to the next level. And so lo and behold, um, Brandy started working with me. And again, I knew this program was not only for me, but for all the Pathfinders who found themselves in the same stage in life I was in. So not only did I agree to tweak the program with Brandy, but again, I believed in it so much that I decided to be the first one to sign up for the program to make sure that it works. And what we like to say at Path to Publishing, we're all experts in what we do. Um, we don't believe what we do or share is going to work. We don't hope it's going to work. We don't feel it's going to work. We don't think it's going to work. We know it's going to work. I needed to know it was going to work. And what we share and deliver Path to Publishing, it all works when you work it. It all works when you work it, just like prayer. Um, so the best decision of 2022, hands down, uh, was not only going through this program, but working with Brandy to be able to present it to the Pathfinders. Because I'll be honest, um, in our newsletter and our following in our tribe, some of our programs that we have coming up, um, for instance, we have an uh, abundance retreat and we have an abundance conference. One is in uh, Vegas and one is in Paris, France. And I can only imagine how many people sit there and crack open because one of them is $5,000. How many people crack open that email and immediately delete it? I don't have $5,000. I'll never have $5,000. What about you and your expertise and your gifts and your talents makes you feel that you're not worthy to be able to $5,000? To be able to receive that, earn that, be gifted that, to, for favor, to be shown on, in, your, in your life, for you to walk in such abundance that price doesn't matter, value, and, and receiving that. Like, what is your mindset? What is the mindset of the people who say, where it looks so unachievable, and not just money, but the experience itself, let me be clear, not money. A lot of people will connect abundance with money and Brandy's going to get into that, but not even the money, but the experience, the blessings, the empowerment that it entails. 
Um, so again, I, I not only was I able to break open abundance, but to this day, I am able to use the lifelong, life-changing and life-saving benefits of the program to excel and level up in ways that I never imagined. And like Brandy said, we don't want to keep this to ourselves. We don't want to be the only ones walking in abundance. <laughs> We want to be able to share this gift. At Path to Publishing, we would never let our investors know. <laughs> we would never let the, the, you know, the, the business side put it in our pitch decks that we don't care when people call us up for that free discovery call and they don't have money in their pocket. We don't care. We don't care. You know, I've worked with experts and they'll say, you know, with your content, don't put, are you a struggling author who needs, no, you don't want to attract people who are struggling. You don't want to bring people who are struggling to your company. Why? We're here to serve. We're here to be servants. And if we have the answer so that they no longer have to struggle, why would we not want to attract them? What we know with Path to Publishing is when we get on these discovery calls and people share their needs, we know within our system, within our team, within our faith, within the way we operate and move, with all the resources we have, we can equip and empower them to get their visions, dreams, and goals met and achieved and done. So we are truly a unicorn. <laughs> and I know we're not the only company who operates that way, but it's amazing when every person who you meet with, who you speak with, who you get on a call with, what's in their bank account and what's in their pocket does not matter. At Path to Publishing, like my business coach taught me, when one of our Pathfinders, when one of our clients win, we win. And when we win, God wins. And we all want the win. We all want to hear those words, you know, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so again, to this day, I'm able to use the lifelong, life-changing and life-saving benefits of the program to excel and level up again in ways I've never imagined. I feel so free. I, I've never been this free. And I tell Brandy all the time, I have never been this free in my life. I have never been so open and so unblocked where I know everything everything that is in alignment, and that's my word for 2023. God gave me my word for 2023. It's alignment. Everything must and will be in alignment so that I will continue to walk in abundance. But walking in abundance is almost like walking in healing and deliverance. You have to. When you've been healed, when you've been delivered, when you've received abundance and you're open and you're unblocked and clear, you have to walk in it. You have to be able to walk in it. A lot of people feel like, oh, I backslid or I thought I was healed and delivered, but this happened and that happened. We have to walk in that. And that is what this webinar is all about. Brandy equipping you with some tools, some information and some resource that's allow you to be able to break it open and to be able to walk in that complete path and life of abundance that is your birthright so that you will, my story will not be your story. And if that is your story now, if you feel like there's a blockage, if you feel like you need to elevate, you, you God gave you this book, this dream, this vision and goal, and it's supposed to do this and it's supposed to save so many lives and it's supposed to change your life, other people's lives, but that is not happening. I do not see that. Stay tuned. Yes. Stay tuned. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that, Joy Lynn. Yes. And that is why we put together this webinar. It was just too good to keep to ourselves. The content that we have received, we knew too many people who wanted and needed it, but money was the thing stopping them. So I said, let's do a free webinar. They can come on. They can get the content. We can help them where they're at. And we can work to help you get where you need to be. So let's get to the good stuff. Now that you've learned more about us and about our story, that's not why you're here. We just want you to understand where all the stuff that we're presenting to you today comes from and why we're giving you what we're giving. 
So step one in breaking open abundance, you're gonna have to redefine success. All right, so I want you to raise your hand if you can give me a definition for what zero means. Ah, there we go, Lola. <laughs> yeah. So what I is zero? I think zero is um, perhaps a place where you feel or maybe you know that you have nothing and that in order for something to become nothing, it's going to need the miracle working power of God. Oh, well, you're close. But I'll tell you, algebra actually tells us what zero is. It's what you get when you add positive x to negative x. And what that really means is if you think about it, it's all the negatives and all the positives throughout the entire universe put together into one indivisible whole. So zero is actually the perfection of possibility. Now, if you thought that zero meant nothing and somebody called you a zero, how would you feel about that? I think myself and perhaps a lot of people would feel that that was just not a good place to be. Yeah, it would be incredibly hurtful. See, it's not what a thing is, but how you define it that determines how you feel about it, okay? But you don't have to accept other people's definitions for words. You are the master who gets to decide what it means for you. So you can control how you feel about what somebody else says, by how you choose to define what that thing means. Like for instance, if somebody tells me you're fat, well, I can take that as them observing my external appearance and making a harsh judgment about it. Or I can say, well, thank you for noticing that I'm fun, attractive and talented and be on my way, right? I, I have the power of definition. I don't have to accept theirs. I can write a definition for it that works for me instead of against me. And the same thing is true about success. Now, society gives us a definition for success, right? We need to have a certain number of titles. We need to have degrees. We need to have a certain amount of money in our bank account, drive the right car, live in the right neighborhood, have the right big house be famous, be powerful, right? Those are society's definitions of success. But we don't have to define our success that way. And I'll tell you a story about this, where I learned this. Um, it was uh, 2008 and I was walking to work and I was just miserable. I mean, absolutely miserable. I was ticking off all of the things that I didn't have in my life. I didn't own my own house. I didn't own a car. I, um, I you know, it was negative in my bank account. I behind on my bills and rent. I was the least paid member of our marketing team. I didn't have any degrees. I didn't have any titles. I didn't have any formal recognition of my value anywhere in there. In fact, I'd been passed over for promotions right, left, and center. I'd been overlooked and, and ignored in spite of my contributions to the team. And I just, I felt so low in my life. I felt like I didn't matter. I felt like I had no value. And I walked into work that day, and I remember telling Jesus, I said, look, I need you to give me something, something to hold on to. Please help me. Now, I worked in the Fortune 500 marketing department. So the company I worked for was a Fortune 500 company, and I was working in their marketing department. So I walked into work, and I opened scripture, and the line that jumped out at me was, foxes have dens, and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And I thought to myself, by all definitions of success that society holds, Jesus was a failure. He didn't own a home. He had to borrow the ass on which he rode into Jerusalem. He, he relied on contributions from people he met. He stayed at their homes. He never, he, he, 
basically had no titles, no degrees, no official political power. He was a nobody from the backwaters of the Roman Empire by society standards. And yet, would I consider him a failure? And like I said, I've worked in the marketing department of a Fortune 500 company. They spent $2 billion a year to gain a fraction of the traction that Jesus Christ managed to gain on a $0 marketing budget. The man's name has been spoken on every continent and in every country around the world. And he did all of that by educating 12 uneducated fishermen from the backwaters of nowhere in the Roman Empire, and he managed to triumph with their help. And today, more than 2,000 years after his death, we're still singing his jingles, seeking his wisdom, buying his programs, and seeking a relationship with him. Was he a failure? Heck no. If there's anything, he was the greatest marketing genius to ever live. And so I said, okay, well, if he wasn't a failure, then maybe I'm not a failure. Maybe I'm just using the wrong measuring stick for success. And I decided that I would figure out what his measuring stick was for success, and I would use that from then on. And that was probably the smartest decision I made in a long time. So I defined success the way that the greatest marketer that ever lived defined his. And that has made all the difference in my life. I didn't realize it, but it was a huge monumental moment. Step two, focus on relationships. Because that is how Jesus measured his success, by the quality and the quantity of relationships that he formed with other people. He always met them where they were and walked with them to where he wanted them to be. One of the things that came to me while I was working, I had wanted to build a successful business from the age of four. Four. And it wouldn't happen for me until I was 42. But one of the reasons is I read in the book, Book Yourself Solid by Michael Port. Every business problem is a relationship problem in disguise. If your relationship skills stink, you're going to have trouble in business. And mine, well, let's just put it this way. They left a lot to be desired. Your network is your net worth. That's something Jim Rohn, international speaker and multiple times best-selling author, was famous for having said. And I'll tell you why. There's a game out there called Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Now, I don't know if you remember who Kevin Bacon is. He's, a, he's an actor, right? And the game is to see how closely connected you are to Kevin Bacon by following the chain of association. So, like, Kevin Bacon appeared in a movie with X. X was friends with somebody who did staging and production for that. You, you happen to know their cousin and their aunt. So that, that would put you forth in connection to Kevin Bacon. Social scientists tell us that we're all only six degrees of connection away from any human being we want to reach on the planet. There are more than eight billion of us on this planet. Chances are good that no matter what it is you need, want, or desire to build, if you can connect to the right person and they see the benefit of giving to you because it's going to benefit them by doing so, you will not have to pay money to get it. They will voluntarily hand it over to you. And you're only six degrees away from the person who has whatever it is you need to build any dream you desire. See, abundance flows from love. Love is the beginning of the fountain of abundance. And relationships are where love begins. Pardon me. My phone just keeps going. <laughs> Math is about relationships. If you want to have help with relationships, learn to love math. See, I, I grew up hating math. Math and I had a love-hate relationship until I was about 36 years old because I could not get. I, I knew it was great for counting money, 
and maybe for planning out recipes and things like that. But I really had a hard time with math because it just didn't click visually for me. And I'm a very visual person. But this, this is a story right here. These four symbols on here. So this first symbol plus means two people or two or more people got together to do something. This multiplication symbol means that they organized in groups. And then this next symbol, the subtraction, means they, they lost something. They, something got taken away from those groups and suddenly they were divided. Short story, but that's what those that symbols mean in that order. Now, if you rearrange the order, you can tell a totally different story about relationships. <laughs> we mentioned the earlier one, right? So this is a story about relationships, right? X plus negative X equals zero. Now, what does that really mean? It means that you're walking along, you're having the best day of your, of your life, right? And then something comes along that has equal power to your positives that's negative. Well, in that moment, you're returned to the perfection of possibility. Anything, you can do anything at that point in time. You can choose to build up by taking what's pot, what you can find that's positive out of that situation and use it to build yourself up. Or you can try to add some negative to the situation and you can end up building down, you know, digging down, making things worse. The more negative you add, the bigger the hole grows. So that's what math teaches us about relationships, is the power of positivity is always there. We can always find something positive, or we can always choose to pull something negative out of any situation. Religion is about relationships, too. Every rule, every tenet, every practice, and every teaching is about relationships. Relationship with you, relationship with love, relationship with your neighbor, relationship with the world around you. So that's where, now the reason most people hate religion is because how they meet it the first time they greet it. It's usually introduced to them as rigid expectations, legalistic indoctrination, growing inconsistency, and overbearing nosiness. And I don't know about you, but I haven't met anybody yet who likes that. But what religion is meant to be is respectful empathy, loving intentions, guided instruction, and ongoing nurturance. And if that were the way it came every time that you met it, you would love religion <laughs> because it would benefit you. And so when people say, I hate religion, what they mean is they hate what they've met of it. They haven't met the real thing. Now, as I said, I'm not trying to convert anybody to any particular religion. You don't have to believe a religion is true to learn from its teachings, just as fiction stories don't have to be true to pass on valuable life lessons. You can learn something valuable from studying it. Now, step three in breaking open abundance is connect to a community. If you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That's an African proverb. And it's absolutely true. You can go quickly alone, but you won't get far because the obstacles are many and the dangers are great. <clears throat> if you want to get far, you got to go together, but you also have to learn to walk at the pace of the slowest member in the pack. Okay. We're all pieces of life in jigsaw puzzle. Now, some of us are fortunate in that we're those little corner pieces. So it's really easy for those people to figure out where they belong. You know, they don't have to do much work. There's only like one or two places they could possibly fit. Some people are those side pieces. So yeah, they have a couple of tricky spots where they're like, eh, I'm not sure which side I belong on. But there's always that one side that's clearly meant to be a side piece. So they don't have to do too much more work. The rest of us are these messy center pieces. You pick us up, you look at us in isolation, and we make no sense. We got these weird indentations and extrusions, and maybe the picture that's on us doesn't even make look like anything. It's just a blob. It's like, what in the heck? And it's not until you connect to community that you snap into place, figure out where you belong, and suddenly your life makes sense. 
and you start operating the way you're supposed to be. Everything about you. See those indentations you have? Those are your weaknesses. Those weaknesses are meant to be there because they're what give other people room to be in their strength, to operate in their strength. Those extrusions that you have, those are your strengths. Those are where you excel. Those are meant to help the people who are weak in that area. So if you're not connecting to community to serve and be served, then you're never really going to make sense of your life. Brandy, I hate to interrupt you there, but I just need you to. That's so profound how our weaknesses empower other people to operate and utilize their strengths. We, we often beat ourselves up for our weaknesses, but those are in us by design because otherwise we wouldn't need each other. We would isolate from one another. So God builds those weaknesses into us so that other people have room to shine. A community is more than the Cheers theme song, okay? <laughs> All right, when I grew up, my concept of community could be limited to the Cheers theme song line where it's, you know, they always, they, they know your name and they're always glad you came. That was my concept of community. That was as far as it went. I, you, they would see you, they would smile, they would wave at you, they would say your name, they would greet you, and we were done with community. <laughs> but that's not really community. Okay? In order to belong to a community, you must first be long in that community. And this was something that God revealed to me, is you have to work past the inevitable hurt that will come from operating as a community. Because people are people, and people are going to fail you, and people are going to miscommunicate, and people are going to do things that hurt. And if you don't stay in that community past the point of pain, you're not going to benefit in the long run. If you leave too quickly, well, every relationship will contain cross and crucifixion moments that you must get past in order to reach the glory and resurrection waiting on the other side. Most people climb down off the cross too quickly. They don't let their egos die. And it's not until the ego dies that love can come forward and really shine and really take hold. There is nothing more freeing and liberating than to forgive someone who has done the unforgivable. There is nothing that will ever touch you more and make you feel more loved than when you know you have screwed it up beyond belief and that there is absolutely no reason this person should forgive you and they offer you genuine forgiveness. There's nothing more healing than that. But most of us don't stay on the cross long enough to get to those points and so the relationships wither and die. And Brandy, again, in, in the abundance program, that's, that was the biggest thing where I, I saw immediate blockage is the part where I chose, because you don't like to take credit for anything, or I always say, you taught me, and you say, well, God gave it to me, so where I chose, you let me know, everything I do is a choice. When I chose to love the unlovable, that, I mean, that was the biggest part where I saw immediate, immediate results. Choosing, choosing to love, choosing to forgive, right down to that person being myself. Forgiving myself for some of the things I chose to do some of the ways I chose to feel, that was the biggest moment in our abundance program. And it, it is, it is one of the biggest blocks in your life in terms of getting to abundance is forgiveness because love can't flow where there's no forgiveness. Love will be stopped by any moment you turn off. The, if any time you choose not to forgive, you are blocking love from flowing freely to you. It's like building this wall around your prized rose bush that you absolutely love because it's so beautiful. It's great. 
you want to protect that rose bush from the dogs that pee on it and the kids that run their bikes over it. And it's understandable because it is beautiful and you want to cherish it and treasure it. But the higher you build that wall, the less of the beauty can be seen. And the higher you build that wall, the more you start killing the very thing you wanted to protect because the sunlight stops being able to reach the rose bush. Your heart's the same way. Building walls around your heart prevents not only the beauty of it from being seen, but the love that you need to thrive from reaching it. You need to forgive and you need forgiveness. And community is where we practice those relationship skills. You know, we practice the skills as we work together toward a common vision, goal, or dream. That is what community gives you. Community is drawn together by a common vision, goal, or dream. We call them the pathfinders at Path Publishing because we're all finding a path forward to reach our dreams. And that's what draws us together into a community. Now, step four, serve to succeed. This is so counterintuitive, counterintuitive to everything you get told about how you should show up, but I promise you it works, all right? 80% of people in any room are there to get something, not to give something. So when you show up as that rare 20% of those who are ready to serve rather than to be served, you will automatically set yourself apart. You will not have to fight for attention. You will not have to work the room. People will come to you looking for your expertise, your counsel, your help, and your advice because you're demonstrating the value you have. Yes, and Brandy, you know, I, I have to share this. I told you, I said, okay, Brandy, you know, I'm going to have to jump in with my testimony because I got to, to edit your slides on Wednesday. And we went through and we talked and we got on the phone. And so I went through those flights on Wednesday and Thursday, I had an event with SCORE, SBA, USA Bank, and um, some other amazing organizations who support um, businesses here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I went in with that attitude. I got up that morning, I said, I'm not here to pass out flyers. I'm not here to pitch because normally sometimes on my way to an event, I practice at my pitch, you know, my spiel, our why, you know, all of those things that we learn to do in business that our mentors teach us. And I said, I'm going to go with Brandy's one slide. Everything so far in this program that I've chosen to do has worked. Why would this be any different? So I went with that attitude. I was so excited to wake up in the morning, to go serve, to go give. I was so excited to see how many people in that room I would be able to help. I went with that attitude. And so it felt different. The drive to the venue was different. It was like the parting of the Red Sea, if you know the traffic here in Vegas. I mean, I was flowing, flowing down the highway, flowing with love and joy and the willingness to serve in my spirit. And when I got there, it's just like Brandy said, it was like I was a, a magnet. Everyone who needed what Path to Publishing has to offer, what the team has to offer, they, they came, they, they, they sensed that, that I was there to serve. And the biggest cherry on top of that was the actual presenter score. They tapped me to now come back for their first 2023 event to be on the panel. And I've also been chosen to be a SCORE media spokesperson, all because I went there to serve and they smelled it, they felt it, they, 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 they touched it. There was hugs. And I, I was in the car and I called Brandy. I'm like, Brandy, it works. <laughs> Not that she didn't already know it works, but I, I implemented, I executed, and that event was so amazing. Although I went to serve and I have all these new connections and, and I will be serving on so many levels, helping these people, I got back a hundredfold, not just in events and opportunities, but the feeling, the feeling, there was no blockage now. The, it, the abundance, the love, the joy, 
it it's it it flows just like abundance does. And like Brandy says, that's what love is. That's where abundance flows through the love. So again, that's just one more testimony. It works. It worked. I did not have to work that room. The room came to me. Everyone was in alignment with what the gifts, the skills, the talents, and not just myself, but the entire path to publishing team has been gifted and equipped to be able to share with them so that they can reach their measure of success, their definition of success. So thank you, Brandy. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you for that. All right, so you are a unicorn. Okay, you may not think of yourself as a unicorn, but you truly are. Even were you to be cloned, there is no one in the whole of human history that could ever replicate your ability to offer humanity what you alone have to offer. Because there's nobody out there who has the combination of genetics, family history, life experiences, knowledge, skills, talents, gifts, abilities, wisdom gained from all those experiences. Nobody else has that. You alone have it. You were born for such a time as this, and you alone have what you have to offer the world. Every act of service done from the heart with a pure intention and not to, not to gain, but to help others, plants a seed of your own future success. I want you to think about that. Every time you serve with a pure intention to help, not to gain, but to give, you are planting a seed of your own future success. Now, we don't know how long that seed is going to take to germinate. It could be a tomato plant. Tomato plants are quick coming up. They're quick to blossom. They're quick to fruit. Could be a pumpkin. You know, pumpkins take a little longer, about six months or so. Okay. Or it could be an apple tree. Apple trees take three years before you're going to see any fruit on that tree. And then the first harvest isn't that great. Maybe you get 20 apples. But every year after that, you start getting more and more apples coming. And the better you take care of that tree, the more apples there will be. Right? We don't know what seed will sprout or what fruit will reap from our sowing, but we can guarantee there will eventually be a harvest. That harvest won't always come from the person we serve. Quite often it will come from outside sources, but it will come and we can be sure of that. Abundance is the sweet fruit of service from a heart that loves others and desires only their best. That so doesn't see other people as something to be gained from, but as something to be given to. Now, step five, and this one is hard, embrace adversity, okay? I promise you on the road to abundance, you're going to meet plenty of adversity. In fact, you know, scripture tells us that when you come to serve the Lord, prepare, prepare yourself for adversity. In times of trial, do not lose faith or hope, but cling to the Lord with all your heart. Adversity is an unavoidable fact of life. Okay? It is the strength training for the soul that we need that helps us cultivate our ability to give and to receive love. So it's actually a very necessary part of our growth. It isn't adversity that's a problem. It's how you look at it that is. Now, there's a reason I have this pile of horse manure here. Okay, so two men are hired for a job. Both men are hired to shovel horse manure from the stall. One man feels the job is beneath him, resents the employer, resents the job, shows up to work with a bad attitude every single day. He hates his job. It stinks. It's backbreaking work, and it's never going to end because the horses are never going to stop pooping, and that's his whole attitude toward it. The other man is grateful for the opportunity to provide for his family. He's grateful that the horse poop is never going to end because it means he's got job security. And yeah, it stinks. And yeah, it's backbreaking work. But it allows him to think. And one day as he's shoveling manure into the pile that they keep out back behind the barn, he notices 
how beautiful the flowers are that grow around that pile of horsemen. Because he's got a good attitude, right? And he keeps that thought in his mind and he thinks to himself, you know what, I bet the other plants would grow just as well. And so he eventually realizes, you know what, I have this massive opportunity. The farmer used to just have him shovel this into the back of a, 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 a tri, you know, back of a wagon and dump it in the forest somewhere. He's like, you know what, what if I took and I bundled up these, the horse manure into bags and then sold it to the farmers around? I bet they would buy it and it would fertilize their plants and it would help them grow. And then I could make a little extra money. So he goes to the farmer that hired him and he properly, he makes the proposal and he says, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll split you 50 50. If you let me have this horse manure and you let me sell it to them, I'll give you 50% of whatever profits I make. Well, the farmer thinks that's a dang good idea because up to now he's been losing money on shoveling horse manure. Now he stands to make some. So the guy with the good attitude starts selling. So now he's doubly happy because his profits are never going to end. The horses are never going to stop pooping. <laughs> he's never going to lose off an opportunity. He gets promoted. He gets wealthy. The guy with the bad attitude ends up being fired. He, he, same poop, same job, same stench, same backbreaking labor. It's the difference in attitude that makes it all. So thank God for adversity. Take to heart his promise uh, that he is right now, even now, working all things for your good and his glory. There is nothing that's happening in your life that is not for your good and his glory. <clears throat> Adversity will always test you before abundance comes to you. Okay? Here's the reality. Destruction has to happen before construction can begin. If you bought a plot of land and there was all this garbage on it and a, and a rundown shed and a, a cracked foundation, <clears throat> and you wanted to build a mansion on that plot of land, if you try to build right away without clearing that other garbage out, <laughs> what would happen is the new house would be unstable. It, it would, you couldn't build as much as you wanted, and it would be a total waste of your time and money. You have to clear out the garbage first before you can build the mansion. The same thing is true of your life. God has to clear out everything that's standing in your way of succeeding in the areas you want to succeed in life before he can start building. So destruction has to come before construction can begin. And the construction phase can last a while. It's noisy. It's, it's messy. It's, you can see the possibilities, but you can't quite reach them. So there's a lot of frustration and impatience as you're trying to reach your destination. But it is important that you not rush the process because rushed work isn't good work. Rushed work is poorly done construction that will not last long. You need to take it in God's timing and allow him to direct the process. And I say all this because uh, my husband was an atheist for the first 18 years of our relationship. And at one point during his, the process of me praying and praying and praying and praying and praying for his conversion, I said, God, why do you take so long to answer my prayer? And he said, because what I build, I build for eternity. If you want rush work, you're going to get work that doesn't last. So be patient and keep praying. <laughs> you know, don't, don't rush the job. How you handle the test determines the outcome because this is designed to prepare you for the next level. If you fail the test, you show you're not ready for the next level. If you let that test get into your head and convince you that you need to quit or that this is the wrong direction or that you should abandon what you're doing, you won't show up and you won't get the reward. You'll quit too soon. And I've done it before. Uh, that was actually one of the reasons why my husband's conversion took 18 years is I would get discouraged and I would feel defeated and I would start to think it was never going to happen and I would quit praying. And I would give up. And at one point in time, God pointed out to me, you, your faith, is what he's looking at to judge whether or not he should believe in me. If you, the foundation of his belief, 
cannot be stable and steady, what has he got to build on? So don't give up. Just because adversity is coming your way, don't, don't give up, don't quit. Don't assume that means it's not meant for you. Assume that the process is you're being tested. You're being, every weakness you have is being tested and you're being shown where they're at so that you can ask for God to give you the strength or the connections you need to get to that next level in the best possible way. Now, step six, I want you to reevaluate wealth and abundance. Okay? Abundance is not in your bank account. I don't care what you have in your bank account today, you are abundantly blessed. If you have negative dollars in your bank account, if you have zero dollars in your bank account, you are abundantly blessed. Money did not come from God. Money is a man-made thing. We made money to protect our hearts. It's a way of evaluating the, to make sure that we're both getting equal value and giving equal value. It has nothing to do with abundance. Like I said, the amount of money you have has nothing to do with abundance. You can be abundantly blessed in a variety of other areas without having any money at all. As with success, you must learn to reevaluate how you see wealth in order to be able to reach abundance. If you have the wrong idea about wealth, you're going to miss what real abundance is about and what real wealth looks like. See, there, there are seven tiers of wealth that society recognizes. The first tier is money, which can be devalued, destroyed, diminished at any time, lost, stolen, destroyed. Imagine if you built an entire life around building up money, and that was all you'd ever done, and then suddenly the value of your money goes from being worth a lot to being worth nothing. How are you going to feel about your life? Are you going to feel good about it? If all you ever did was build for money, no, you're gonna wanna, you're gonna see no point in continuing. Don't put your hopes in money, it will disappoint you. You use money to gain the next level of wealth, which is possessions. But possessions, just like money, can be lost, stolen, diminished, destroyed, devalued at any time. Real estate can go from being top of the food chain to being bottom of the barrel in no time at all. Yeah, earthquakes can come along and swallow up land. There's all kinds of things that can happen to possessions. So we build possessions because that offers us a measure of safety and security, but it's not everything. Above possessions is knowledge. Knowledge is great, but knowledge, without the wisdom of knowing how to apply it, as Adam and Eve learned, will not, <laughs> will not prosper you. It can actually make you afraid, terrified, and too paralyzed to know what to do next. If, we, if you want proof of that, we have an internet full of knowledge, and how many fools do we have running around with more knowledge than they know what to do with, and not enough wisdom to know how to apply it. All right, so wisdom is greater than knowledge. Now, above wisdom comes your health, because without health, you're not going to be able to enjoy the other, the others. You're just you know, you're, you're going to be too sick to care. Above health comes time. Trading your health to get more time. That's why you invest in your health, is to buy yourself more time. And what is the time to be used for? The pinnacle of the pyramid, which is love. Because the greatest wealth there is, is love. All right. So if you believe money has the power to stop you or to enable you to succeed, you will overlook alternative means from achieving your desires. No matter what it is you want, need, there is someone out there who can help you get it if you just connect with them and make clear the value of helping you to get what you need. Money is not necessary. Money is one way of achieving your dreams and goals. It is not the only way. Your greatest wealth is not even in your bank account. It is in your head and in your heart. It is in the combination of education, experience, knowledge, wisdom, gifts, talents, skills, abilities, achievements, accomplishments, family history, personal and professional relationships. And this brings me to my next point. 
And we're getting close to the end here. I do apologize. We are 15 minutes over. I, I hope you will bear with us. We went a little longer than I planned. Um, stop hiding your gold. This is the most important thing I can tell you. Your failure, your traumas, your griefs, your pain, your shame, your guilt, your problems, those are all a gold mine of wisdom waiting to be mined. Those are what you have that only you can offer the world. They're the most beautiful things you can have. Those are what connect you to the people you were born to lead and allow you to reach them where no one else can. No one else, no one who hasn't been where they've been can understand their pain the way you can. Everything that happened to you was allowed for you in order to transform you into the star that you were meant to be so you could shine your light and help the lost find their way in the darkness. That is the truth. Stars are not born in easy circumstances and neither are leaders, okay? In order to form a star, gases have to be gathered together, pressed down, pressed down, pressed down, pressed down. So much pressure put on them, that eventually they either do one of two things. They either ignite and light up the night, or they collapse in on themselves and become a black hole and suck the light from everyone else around them. You're the only one who gets to choose what you're going to do with the stuff that happened to you. You can either ignite it and let it light up the night for those who need it, or you can allow it to make you collapse in on yourself and become a black hole that sucks the life and the light from everyone else. Hopefully, you'll choose to be a leader. You were not born to fit in. Now, many of us in this mock webinar, I guarantee you, found ourselves in situations as we were growing up where we were ostracized, pushed out, made to feel unwanted, unloved, that we didn't belong. And we took it in and we made it a story about us not being lovable or not being worthy or not being good enough, and it wasn't true. You see, you were not born to fit in. You were made to stand out so that those who need you can find you. Because if you fit into the crowd, how in the heck are the people who need you going to find you? So please, stop trying to fit in and recognize that there is a value in standing. Forgive those who couldn't understand or accept you. Forgive those who rejected and abandoned you. Forgive yourself for the things you thought, which was that you were not good enough or worthy enough for them. It wasn't true, but you need to forgive yourself for that because you took it in your heart as the truth. So you need to tell that person, that younger version of you, that it's not true. Thank God. For those who hurt you and those who forced you out of your comfort zone and on the road to becoming the star you were born to be. Without them, they may have locked you in a prison, a mental prison, but without them doing that, <laughs> you wouldn't have found the keys that set you free and you wouldn't have the keys to give to others. They didn't know it, but they were unwittingly equipping you with the weapons you would need to forge your greatest victories in life. Everything that happened to you is going to be transformed into something that works for you. All right. We have reached the end of that presentation. Now, you can all unmute yourself. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear them. And I strongly advise you to just unmute and share. Yeah, um, share if you, even if it's in a personal, for personal experience and you want you know, Brandy to give you customized tools and guidance and information for your particular situation. If you're open to sharing, um, I would take advantage of that, you know, many abundance breakout session right now by bringing forward your questions or like Brandy said, your comments. Well, first, I would just like to say thank you for sharing. It was very informational, and I could relate to a lot that was said. I do know that forgiveness is the way to start a healing 
and to move forward. So I was glad that it touched on that. And I have actually forgiven quite a bit in my life. I'm working on the process for giving. Um, I just got out of a 35 year marriage and I'm very grateful to be free. So I'm working on forgiving that part of my life and my role that I played in it. I made sure that I know that I am accountable. So now with the understanding of being accountable, I am working on forgiving and releasing that and feeling great for being free. So I thank you because it touches on and it reminded me during this session that I'm actually on the right track and to keep going. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's hard to see in the moment when you're in the greatest pain how the situation is going to work in your favor and how it's actually helping you. But believe me, it's like we are, and if, if you're a tiny cup, right, and, and you can maybe handle only this much love in your soul, in order to expand your capacity for love, God actually has to come in and break you open and spread you apart. <laughs> <laughs> and then come back in and fill in more clay and build you back up and reshape you so that you can have a greater capacity for love than you had before. But that process doesn't feel good and that process isn't easy um, because you're kind of attached to who you were. And we all get comfortable in our comfort zone. And that's actually the greatest, the place of greatest danger for us is we can get comfortable in our discomfort. And in our comfort zone is all where all the falls in the Bible take place in the people's comfort zone. Adam and Eve fell in the paradise, the comfort zone. They, they got comfortable, they got complacent, they weren't watching. Boom, they were taken down. David, he got comfortable in the palace, got complacent got lazy, didn't head out to battle with his men, decided to stick at home, kick it on the couch, relax in his kingly palace. And that's where he saw Bathsheba, and well, we all know the rest of that story. So it's in our comfort zones that we have the greatest risk of falling. And that's why God boots us out of our comfort zones anytime he notices us stepping into there. And that's always going to come with adversity. So <laughs> thank you for sharing that, Valerie. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And I just wanted to say one more thing. During this time of, I've been through much in my life, but I have learned that the tests are actually lessons. And once I learned the lesson, the test does not repeat itself. And you get to move to the next level. But those tests will come in different forms until we pass them. Yes. Yeah. God is a very patient teacher, and he's happy to let us relearn the lesson as many times as we need and retake the test as many times as we need until we manage to pass it. So if you keep coming up with the same pattern in your life, that is a clue that there is something you are missing. You know, it's the same kind of things. If you keep meeting the same kind of people in the same kind of situation, they keep repeating themselves. This is a strong indicator that you have failed the test, my sisters, <laughs> and you need to go reevaluate what you did wrong, where you went wrong, and what it is that God's trying to tell you. <clears throat> so. Anybody else got comments? You know, I'm, I'm struck too with how patient God is. You know, when we look at even that story of um, David and Bathsheba, and how they lost that child. And, um, you know, the sorrow that came with that. You know, they eventually, you know, did have somebody who came into their lives afterwards, and that was Solomon. And Solomon was um, a great gift. In fact, one of the rulers that gave us a lot of the truths 
in the Bible about wisdom. He made his own mistakes, yes. Oh well, yeah, he did. <laughs> okay. But you know, it says adversity will always test you before abundance comes to you. That is so true. You know, um, even when you have gone through periods of abundance, there will still be times of that adversity coming into your life to see what God has placed in you and if it's been used before. And other times he wants to refine it. And just to recognize that because you're going through that phase again, doesn't mean that you are a complete failure. It is the fact that God wants to complete that process in you. And so that's very, very powerful. Yeah, what, what he has begun in you, he will work to complete. Mm -hmm. To the degree that you allow him in, to the degree that you open yourself up to receive what he has for you, he will definitely work to complete what he begins in you. Uh, we're often our, his greatest obstacle. <laughs> we're the one so, that gets in the way. So Brandy, then how, what would you say to someone who they're, they're in that adversity, they're in that test, and it may be the hardest, most painful test they have ever experienced in their life. They, they just feel like there is no light at the end of the tunnel. I, can, I, I can't even breathe right now. How can I continue? Or do I even want abundance? Like, how can I even move forward, let alone in abundance, but just move forward, period, so that I'm still operating, even in this pain, even in this adversity, how do I still operate in that? How do I still move? How do I still breathe? How do I still serve? Yeah, well, when we're in the middle of adversity, it is very hard to think about serving others. In fact, that is the greatest test we have of our capacity love, is can you, in the middle of your own pain, in the middle of your own anguish, in the middle of your own cross, because you will have them, how, how you show up to serve others is a test of your capacity to love. How much you have learned to be a disciple of Christ is proven in that moment of service. And you'll grow in your capacity, but this is one of the reasons that adversity is given to you, is so that you know and have a clear way of checking on yourself as to how well you've mastered the art of loving past the moment of pain. Can you love from the cross? Can you put a smile on your face when your world is falling apart and mean it? Not, not that you're faking it, it's just gotta be sincere from the heart. Um, nobody knew this, but over the last week, I have had just Every kind of adversity has been thrown at me. And in fact, Wednesday, I got totally thrown off guard by some deeply hurtful betrayals that were done by people I care about a lot. And um, it took my headspace and yanked me out of my, <clears throat> my mode of preparation for this webinar. Um, and then on top, to, to add fuel to the fire, somebody else came in and jumped on me um, without understanding the context of the situation or what had been done and basically blamed me for the whole thing and told me what a horrible person I was for how I responded and I, like, you know, so then, oh, derail, you know, the temptation was to derail off of this. But then I recognized when I went to Mass um, Thursday night, you know what? This is, this is Satan trying to get in my head, trying to, trying to stop this webinar from doing its work. And I refuse to allow him permission to do that. And so I was able to forgive the people who hurt me, to let go of it, to apologize for my part in it, and to step back and say, you know what? No, I'm choosing love. I'm choosing love. 
And I will tell you something that came out of it. In the, middle, in the middle of it, God reminded me of something he told me a while back. He said, I want you to, anytime that situation comes up where you are feeling hurt and wounded, to stop, ask my advice, seek mm-hmm. the most loving thing that you can say or do, and then speak boldly, standing from a position of love. So say it was sass, okay? Be sass. Stop, ask, seek, speak. Hmm. Because we all tend to speak out of our hurt and our emotional pain, and that never is a good thing. Doesn't ever come out well. Doesn't ever have a good result. But if we stop, we ask God for help, and we seek the most loving thing we could do or say, and then we speak boldly based on the love that we have in our hearts for the other people, we won't go back. And at the end of the day, we'll feel good about what we did, even if they don't, even if it doesn't change anything that they did. And like Valerie said in her comments, you know, find what, what is my lesson in this? What is my lesson in what I'm dealing with in any blockage, in any adversity, in any pain? What is my lesson in this? And I say to you, don't feel guilty for finding good in a bad situation and circumstance. A prime example is COVID. You will hear so many people singing the praises of the pandemic while it was the worst time in other people's lives. Lives were lost. But these people are not ashamed to say we found the good in this horrific situation. We were able to find the the, the lessons in this. So don't be, don't feel guilty about finding the good and the lessons in those bad situations, in that pain in that adversity. And I will say too, if life is shoveling manure in your direction faster than you can handle it, you can better believe you are being prepared for a season of abundance. Okay, because that's what a farmer does to his choice of prized plants is he shovels fertilizer on top of it, you know, faster than the plant can process it. He's putting that fertilizer on there and fertilizer is mostly manure, so. If you find life shoveling manure in your direction faster than you can process it, you are being prepared for the season of growth. All right, so your assignment, ladies, you have an assignment to do. Woohoo! First of all, I want you to- Brandy, email. can you make sure nobody else had any more questions or comments? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Did anybody else have questions or comments to make? I have one. All right, Danielle. I'm looking forward uh, to hearing it. Hello, everyone. Um, First of all, wow, <laughs> just wow, seriously, Brandy. Um, this was absolutely amazing, needed. Um, you know, you hear things multiple times, but when you hear it in the season that you need it, that is when it truly resonates and can make a change. And so a lot of things that you said, I know I've heard it before. I can truly honestly say that. I know I've heard it before, but I am grateful and honored to hear it now in the season. Like I'm, I'm almost in tears and I'm not a true emotional person because I'm like, wow, it's resonating with me and it's hitting me because it's time for me to hear it now. And it's time for me to hear it now, to move now in a different kind of way. And um, so I already knew it was gonna be great because those that know me know I do everything which Joy Lynn does. Um, and so when she said that she was <laughs> she was doing, um, you know, I'm just like, okay, I, of course I need to be a part as well. And so I'm, I'm grateful for, for what Ms. Joy Lynn received out of it because I know it always trickles down to the rest of us. Right. Um, and so I am grateful for that. 
Um, I'm grateful that I came in though for myself. Okay. Cause I know I copy the right cat. Okay. You <laughs> I have. Do, no, I you do. definitely do. Um, but I, I am, I'm truly grateful that this was presented to the Pathfinders, um, and to other people as well, but truly to the Pathfinders because we are an amazing team. Um, and so that I love, um, you know, I'm excited to get, uh, the replay because the replay is being offered, correct? <laughs> okay. Well, we will be, yeah. Okay. I, I was really awesome. Because I want to play this in my uh, sleep time as well, so that it can it can really truly you know get into my subconscious as well. And for others that you know would be able to do that, I definitely suggest that. That has been helping helping me during this journey right now of being focused. And um, just as someone else was saying about the repeating of, and what is the lesson? Ms. Joyland told me this not too long ago. I was going through something and she said it, like, I can't afford to not learn the lesson, you know, to, so, to make sure that I don't repeat it. And so I, I just wanted to say that, Brandy, I had to tell you and I had to say it openly, like, thank you. Thank you for the time that you took to put this together and then to share it. Thank you. That is the kind of thing that makes it worth it, Daniel. Yes. To be perfectly honest. Like I said, there were so many obstacles that came up, so many things that could have stopped this. And I just was like, this is, this is not, you know, I know this is what God wants me to do. And in fact, the obstacles are just confirmation I'm on the right path. I have a question as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely, Doc. Um, a lot of people are not religious. So, for me, I understand I am, you know, spiritually inclined. Have you thought about to reach a broader audience to make it where it's not so focused on the Bible, not to take anything away, but to reach those like who are not spiritually inclined? I feel like if I took that part away, I would be missing on sharing them the best part of it because honestly it has been um me learning to walk with the cross me learning to accept that the cross is going to be part of loving other people that there's no way to avoid it there, okay. there is no way to get around it and if you don't understand that you won't be able to achieve the, the things that i've been able to achieve if you can't walk with the cross you can't go where i want yeah. So, um, that's why I say, though, they don't have to believe that the cross exists. They don't have to believe that Christ was real. Just like you can accept a fiction story and enjoy a fiction story and get lessons, life lessons, out of a fiction story without believing it's true. And that's why I said that at the beginning, that I'm not trying to yeah. convert you to any particular religion, and I'm not asking you to change your beliefs. It's kind of like, and we've had this discussion and we work with clients all the time. I don't want to put too much God in it because I want to reach. And then we decided when Mel Gibson did the passion of the Christ, did he say, let's take God out of this so people will understand this message. Whoever comes and sits in this theater, whoever clicks this on Netflix, whoever watches this DVD, they're in alignment with this message. So and I'm not <laughs> saying to take yeah. God out of it. Yeah. I'm saying to be more um, practical. Yes. So I'm not saying exclude God at all, because I do know where my higher being is and what it is to me. So that I'm not saying, so I want to make that clear. So just to be practical for those who don't know. Okay. I, I would be open to hearing your suggestions. Um, maybe we can talk about that more, you and I personally. So, but yeah, I mean, I'm open to hearing because I talk with atheists all the time. So I've learned to talk um, more about love. Yes. Because God is love, right? So yes. that is the reality is that when you're talking about love, you actually are talking about God. Okay. I would be happy to share because I do have a couple of ideas okay. on that. Yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. That and thank you, Valerie. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for being so engaging throughout this entire webinar, period. Thank you. 
All right, so like I said, we have assignments for you. Now, if you'll email info at pathtopublishing.com, subject line, Abundant Blessings, whoop, let me go back. You'll be added to our Breaking Open Abundance mailing list so you can keep up with all the ways we are helping you with Breaking Open Abundance in 2023. Now, at the beginning, this is not a sales presentation. I'm not asking you to whip out your wallets or your purses or your credit cards because I'm not selling you anything. Okay? But Joy Lynn did mention the Paris uh, conference that we're having in the fall and the, the spring uh, retreat that we're doing on abundance in April. And there will be also a Breaking Open Abundance Mastermind. So there's all kinds of ways for you to participate. And we look forward to sharing those with you in, in our newsletter. So if you want to be included in that information, just email that. Now, my second is keep a gratitude journal. Thank God each day for all the good things that went the way you wanted them to, but also all the things that didn't. Remember, all of it is working in your favor. So everything that happens that's good, thank God. Everything that happens that you didn't want, thank God. It's all working in your favor. And keep a track record of that because you're going to start to see a pattern of God showing up in ways you didn't expect often through the things that you didn't want more so than he shows up in the things that you did. And the third is, if you feel called to do so, please request a free Breaking Open Abundance one-on-one -on -one consultation through the email that we gave you, okay? We want to help you get past any spiritual or material blockages in your way. I will be walking you through a one-on-one -on -one consultation. I am more than happy to give you my time and help you do that. Just because... I feel like I have been given so freely and so generously by God that it would be stupid of me to deny that to other people. Now, our gift to you, thank you for staying to the end. I know that we have pushed your patience probably to its limit. We are now 40 minutes over time. Congratulations to us. Woo-woo. <laughs> but our free gift to you is turning problems into profits. If you do send that email with what we told you, abundant blessings in the subject line, you will also be given a free copy of my my book, Turning Problems into Profits. Now, a funny story about this book is, um, well, kind of a funny story. Okay, so the story actually starts when I'm 23 years old. And my husband, he comes home early from work, looks me in the eyes, tells me they fired me, walks to the back bedroom, closes the door. And I'm at the kitchen table. My son is playing in the living room. And in that moment, I just lost all hope. It was just like every bit of hope that I had in me drained right out. We didn't have enough money. His last check was not going to be anywhere near enough to pay our rent, which was due the following week. I had no job. There was not enough time for me to get together the money. And all I could see was life being this series of endless problems with no solution. And I just lost all hope. And I looked at the bottle of pills that were on the table, and I thought to myself, how many of those do I have to take so that I don't have to hurt myself anymore? I'm just done. I just can't, I can't do this anymore. And then a thought came on the table, okay, but who would take care of my son? Because I knew my husband had told me if he ever lost me, he'd commit suicide. I didn't trust my mother. I, my family, most of them were in worse, you know, either the same shape I was in or worse shape. Um, my husband's family, I didn't trust them to take care of my son. They were special kind of people. And <laughs> I was just like, the next thought came to me, well, if I can't leave them with anybody, I can take them with me. And ladies, I'm going to tell you that is what snapped me out of it. The realization I had just thought about taking the life of my own son my baby, whom I loved with every fiber of my being, I had literally just entertained the thought of killing him. Like, no, hell no. <laughs> That's not how this is playing out. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm going to fight to give him a better life if it takes me the rest of my life to achieve that. So problems, the fact that there was a never-ending series of problems facing me was what got me to that point where I actually thought about taking my son's life along with my husband. Fast forward to 2019 and a Saturday in March. And I wake up out of a dream going, I have problems. I have problems. I was so excited to have problems. 
Because in that dream, what God had shown me was that every problem that I'd faced in the past that I'd learned to solve was something I could package up and sell to people in my present moment that could make me profit, that could solve my financial problems today. And every problem that I didn't know how to solve that I was facing was money for tomorrow. I was never going to run out of problems, and I was never going to run out of opportunities for profit. And that's why I wrote that. And it takes you step by step through a process where you can take any problem that you've faced, any pain that you've gone through, and turn it into a profitable business. Because I want you to know that there is nothing that faces you that God does not have a good plan for you. And this is my thank you. <laughs> so now that you guys have sat through all of that, whew, we made it together. <laughs> I just do want to thank you guys for hanging in there, sticking it out, making it through to the end. You guys are awesome and amazing. And you have validated every bit of struggle that I went through this week and made it all worth it. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, guys. <clears throat> thank you, everyone. And again, just email info at pathtopublishing.com um, to request either a one-on-one, -on -one, um, your free book, or both. And thank mm -hmm. you again so much for your time. We appreciate you all.